Hello, everyone. Happy Thursday. It's Debbie DeGroat here, CEO and co-founder of Forward Coaching. Today, we're going to talk about building a profitable team. So if you wouldn't mind, type a hello in the chat box. Maybe, maybe let me know what was the question on your mind as you registered to attend our event today. I'm going to make sure that I leave some time at the end of the webinar to go back and answer those questions. Thank you, Pete, I appreciate that. So I know you guys can hear me loud and clear. And I just want to say in advance that it's not my intention on this webinar to convince you that you should build a team. But if you're going to build a team or you already have a team, then we have to be crystal clear that the goal of having a team certainly is to give you leverage potentially freedom, allow you to adjust your role and activities. And also though, first and foremost, we need to make a profit, right? <laughs> because it is a business, so we need to make a profit. So we're gonna dive in today, please, as we go, feel free to type your questions in. And if I may stop along the way, but I will circle back and we'll cover those at the end. We are recording this session today. So it just takes, I think, one to two days to edit it. And then we send that out to you. You don't need to send me your email. We already have it because when you register, that automatically triggers us to send you a copy of that recording. So we will be sending that to you, okay? So, you know, when I got started in real estate, at the age of 18, teams did not exist. The only way that people that had that real entrepreneurial spirit could grow would be to leave and create their own brokerage. Well, fortunately, over the years, some really smart entrepreneurs figured out, I don't need to leave my brokerage or my brand where I'm happy. I just need to build a team inside of that brand. And in fact, it's so profitable for many that you actually see people who are an independent broker, but they're running it as if it is a team instead of a typical brokerage. So teams are here to stay, whether you love them or don't love them, they are here to stay. Uh, they dominate many markets. And today we're gonna look at some of the pros and cons and mistakes made. And I will say that you know, over the last 22 years, I truly have had the pleasure of coaching everything from startup teams to some of the biggest in the entire country. Some of you who know Ben Kinney know I was Ben's coach beginning 13 years ago as he was really building and developing all of his many teams that he has across the country. So I've seen it all, <laughs> the good, bad, and the ugly, I guess you'd say. So today we're also going to send you another gift, or I should say when you uh, receive your recording. So within one to two days, we're going to attach another gift. It's a team building questionnaire, and you don't need to return it to me. It's, it's not homework. It's just for you, whether you have a team and maybe you're not quite happy with that team or you're thinking to build a team to really sit down and do some self-discovery. Why do I want a team? Where are my strengths? Where are my gaps? What's my vision for this team? You know, do I want to end up being out of production and just running the team? Do I always want to stay in production and I want to hire a director of sales? So it just gets you thinking a little bit about what is it that you are really looking to build? So that Allison, know that it will not be in the chat. It's going to be sent to you within the next one to two days, along with a copy of this recording. So thank you for asking, but we'll get that right to your email, okay? So before we talk about building a team, let's take a minute and examine why do so many teams fail so that we can learn from their mistakes? Because I'm sure each and every one of you knows plenty of teams that over your years in the business, did not make it. In fact, sometimes they crash and burn and go down in flames. So why does that happen? Usually it's because there was no plan or process. They just sprung up organically. 
You know, the other day I had a call from someone here in our local market and they're a very strong agent. They do a very good business. They are a single agent. And he said to me, you know, people just would call me and say, I'd love to be on your team. And I felt like, wow, that's a compliment and that's an opportunity. So I said, sure. And he said, now I have these eight people and I don't know what to do with them. And they're distracting me and I'm making less money and they're not making me any money. It's just a big giant mess. I don't know what to do. Well, see, what happened is he never had an intention on building a team. So therefore, he didn't have his foundation. Um, when we were at Built How, our last event, Ben talked about, you know, thinking of your business like building a house. First, it's the foundation. Then it's the walls. Then it's the roof. Then it's the furniture. Well, he had no foundation. He didn't have systems and processes to transfer over. He didn't have staff to help support. And he just took whoever came to him and they were not the right fit. Now, sometimes I also see that people will hire their spouse or their friends or its uh, family members and they say, let's be a team. And you know what? That's okay. You love them. You want to do it. You want to make it work. Where the breakdowns sometimes occur, though, is the person that's stuck in a particular role, maybe they were not ever meant to be in that role. But, well, it's my wife or my partner or it's my best friend and they needed a job or I just want to work with them. So I'm not saying you shouldn't work with family and friends. My daughter Taylor here is the president of Forward. I mean, I think we all love to give our family opportunity just carefully consider, is the role that I'm placing them in, is that good for them? Is that right for them? And do their talents, skills, and abilities make them suited for it? And then I think the next piece is complete clarity of what is that job description and what are the expectations that you have as the team leader and making sure that it's really handled in the most professional way that you can with lots of clarity. You know, Taylor is my daughter and I love her. And yet Taylor knows that if she didn't show up for work, if she did not do her job, if she did not perform as her role requires, I would fire her. Because you see, I have commitments to all of you, to our clients, to my staff to my life to run an efficient business. So where I see it fall apart with people you know is you just didn't tell them exactly what they needed to do. And if they weren't doing it, you're not course correcting along the way. So I wanna be careful. So the systems and the, the foundation to plug the team members into, they didn't have it, so it floundered. But let's talk for a minute about, in a minute, about those systems. I'm going to go deeper into that. But before we do, here's another common mistake why teams don't profit. The splits paid were too high. And the, the time for the team leader to invest, to manage these people, and to also supply things for them, resources or tools or admin support, that at the end of it all, the team leader barely broke even or more commonly actually went into the red. You know, a team leader came to us for coaching at the beginning of the year and they said, I really need some help. They said, I used to make close to a half a million dollars a year as a single agent with an admin. Then I decided to build a team. And last year we grossed a million four but I personally only earned 100,000. I took a $400,000 pay cut. See, when I looked at the numbers, it's because she was providing lots of resources, spending money on marketing, and the splits were way too high. 
So there was no profit for her, right? So that's where we have to be a little bit careful. And also the lack of clarity and vision and lack of leadership. You know, I always ask our clients when they join us, when they come to forward to join us, I ask them, what is your vision for three, four or five years from now? You know, it doesn't have to be perfect, crystal clear in every aspect. It's just why, again, why am I building this team? Maybe it's, I want to build a team and then I'm going to get the systems running and then I'm going to sell my team, transfer it to a leader and have an earn out for me. That's a great vision. And if that is your vision, there's actually a really good book out there called The Golden Handoff. And the author is Crowder, like sauerkraut, Crowder. And the book is The Golden Handoff. Half of the book is if you want to build a team to sell, a business to sell, a real estate business, how to do it. And the other half is how to buy an existing agent's real estate business. So that could be a reason. My vision is I want to build this, get it going, make it valuable, and transfer it to someone. Or maybe my vision is, as I said earlier, you know, I'm just, I'm tired of taking buyers out. I'm tired of meeting with sellers. I want to continue each year to elevate my role until I am the CEO, coordinating the marketing, coaching and training my people. So think about what you want that to be. And then as you're going along that path, where are your leadership gaps? Where are the skills that you're going to have to master? And for some of you, it might be, I need to master the skill of examining my P&L and tracking my expenses each month. I need to get a great CPA to help me with that. You know, we all have our things that we're really good at, but often there's a lot of gaps. And, you know, I think of um, rainmakers. You know, we're all salespeople. That is what we do. And there's a book, it's actually a pretty old book, but still a goodie called The E-Myth. And I'm going to type it actually in here right now because it'll make it easy for you to find. And some of you know it. The author is Michael Gerber. So in the book, here's the story that Michael begins with. He says, you know, there was a lady who in town was known as the most fabulous, phenomenal pie maker. And she would make pies out of her home and she would sell them to people, friends, family. And they all said to her, you need to open a pie shop. You would do great. So she leased a space, bought the equipment, set about hiring staff, launched her pie shop, and it very quickly fell apart and failed. Why? Because she was a pie maker, not a business owner. No one had trained her. No one had given her a blueprint and said, these are the systems, the processes, here's the kind of people you need to hire, the experience they need to have, here's how you need to manage them, here's how you need to manage your books. No one taught her and she had no brain map for it, and she failed. So Michael's um, point in the book, the E-myth is the entrepreneurial myth, that just because you're a phenomenal entrepreneur, that does not make you a natural-born business builder. And building a team is building a business. But you can learn, right? You can learn, and that's often... When clients come to us for coaching, they're saying, all right, I, I want to build a team and I need to coach with a coach that has helped others do that or has had a team themselves and has a success track record and they can share their systems, their models, their splits. So it's completely normal that teams fail because that entrepreneur did not know how to build a business. So I just don't want that to be you, right? And leading a team is just really, it's not for everyone. And some people are actually looking at their team 
and saying, I want that to be a great admin, a transaction coordinator, maybe a VA that helps with marketing and my vendors and affiliates. And that's my team. And that's just fine. So what is your goal? What is your long-term vision? And what does team mean to you? And then to get you there, the assessment on those skills that you need to develop, right? So then also, I, I, I think I skipped one. Ah, there we go. So then let's assume you have a team or you're planning, this is it, I'm doing it this year. Then I want you to write down, you can grab a piece of paper right now and write down how many units would you like your team to do? And of those units, how many of those would you personally continue to do? So let's say for an example that someone says, I wanna do as a team 100 units. And I'm willing as the leader of the team to do half of those. Well, then obviously that means we have to take those remaining units, the other 50, and say, how many agents am I gonna need to recruit? And who is my ideal candidate going to be? Now, I was recently on a Zoom with Ben, and he was talking to a group of about 300 of the best teams in the country, the team leaders. And he said to them, in 2024, if you're going to recruit a mixture of new and seasoned agents, and, and we still know we're in that market where inventory is a little bit tight and we're still hoping rates are going to go down a little more and out looks like it may be closer to the summer than the spring. He said, be very conservative in your estimates. He said, if you're doing new and seasoned, assume what if each agent averaged about six units per year? Now, you may think, wow, that sounds really, really low. You know, it's better when you're calculating your team goal and your team production that quietly in your own mind, you go on the low side. In fact, Ben said on that session that if someone would tell him, I want to do 12 deals this year, he would likely cut that in half quietly for his own calculation, just so that he doesn't under recruit to close, you know, to uh, accomplish closing that unit gap, right? So what is the right amount of units that a producing operator should do? Well, that's really up to you, how you structure your team, what you love to do best. However, if you as a team leader are 90% of the units produced, then you really don't have a business right? You still have a job with a little random sprinkling of some extra money. So I wouldn't throw the baby out with the bathwater, as they would say. I wouldn't go from doing most of the production to saying I'm doing no production. We're just not really in the right market for that. And in fact, in that Zoom I was on, those top team leaders, some of them have not done production for years, and they had committed in 2024 to do two deals a month. So if they had a team that's gonna do 100, 200, 500, they said, I'll do two deals a month. Now you might say, well, I don't wanna do two. I wanna do one and I want four team agents each doing another one a month. Great, remember, it's your plan, it's your formula. But what we need to realize is you wanna recruit based on conservative numbers, that they would do. So I'll give you another example. Let's say you're fortunate enough to recruit a seasoned agent that did 25 units last year and they worked full time, they were all in. And now they're telling you this year, they're gonna do 50. Will they do 50? Maybe. What new actions are they gonna take? What new skills do they need to develop? I wouldn't discourage them if they're excited and they have a plan and path. But if I want to be safe as a team leader, I will assume they'll do 25. See what I mean? So just go on the conservative side. Um, and then once you discover who is your ideal 
candidate, where will you find them? So do you love working with brand new agents? Are you going to find them off of the state lists, um, applicants for the test, licensing schools? You know, where are you going to find them? One of my favorite can can uh, candidates or type was what I call the broken wing. And that's six to 18 months in the business. And they've done a little few deals, maybe three, four, five deals. And they just didn't land in the right place. They didn't have the right guidance, but they still want to do the job. They're still excited about it. And they just need that right leader to scoop them up and bring them along. Now, what I love about Broken Wing is they know it's not so easy, right? If some of you have interviewed brand new people coming into the business, what do they all say? I want to make a hundred thousand, right? <laughs> That's what they all say. And they think it's easy. I remember working with a recruit once and that recruit said to me, um, I just, I, I said, what do you want to, why do you want to get into real estate? And they said, you know, because I, I just, I, I want to dress up every day and I want to look at beautiful houses. And then I think, then you go to lunch and then you, you know, you go to the bank and cash your commission checks. I'm like, oh, honey, <laughs> right? If it were only that easy. But the beauty of the broken wing is that they know it's not that easy. And maybe they've been treated not great where they were before. You bring them on board, provide value, coaching, mentoring, and training, and get them quickly into better production, and they're much more likely to stay. So how do you find Broken Wing? You could teach classes at the board. Um, some people go out and hit open houses and meet the agents that are holding them open engage. How are they doing? Are they professional? Did they set the open house up well? I loved looking at the agent on the other side of the deal. Did I enjoy working with them? Did they have integrity? Would I feel they'd be a good fit for my team culture? Sometimes vendors and affiliates can recommend them to you right? So I would think about where can I find them? Um, some of you may have access to lenders who have broker metrics, or they can go in and run a filter. Many, many lenders use broker metrics because you can run a filter for the agent's production um, and they can give you a list. Some of you may look in your multiple listing. So, you know, get out there, meet them, see them in action, and then ask simply, are you open-minded to a potential opportunity? Well, are you trying to recruit me? You know, possibly. And the reason I say possibly is because we don't know each other well enough to know if you'd be excited about what I'm offering or if I would feel you're a right fit for my team. I'm only planning to hire just a few select wonderful people to join us this year. Why don't we talk? When would be a good time tomorrow for us to get together for coffee? See, the thing I think we get hung up on when we're trying to recruit talent for our teams, I don't like to call these agents. I don't like the rejection. I hate recruiting. But you know, if you think about it, when someone wants you, they're recruiting you, they're pursuing you, even if you're not interested, it's an extreme compliment. And you know, the last broker I worked for before where I started coaching full time, he had pursued me for probably 10 years. It was very gracious. He didn't spend a lot of time. He'd call me, he'd see me at a meeting, but he always he would say, I want you to join me. And I, I'll, I won't forget about you when you're ready, when it's time to make a change. So I guess you would say he nurtured me. One day, my broker going through divorce decided to shut the office down. Suddenly, I have no place to work. Who do you think I called? 
right? So we got to figure out who's our candidate, where are we going to find them, and then what leverage or staff am I going to need to have so that I can still do my production as I'm onboarding these new people and they're going to help me manage them. I, I love what Philip said. Um, I always say, even if I don't want to go to the party, I appreciate the invitation, right? And Holly, yes, this is being recorded. Absolutely. So then when we think about, you know, doing all of this, doesn't it make sense to be really careful on your interview process? You know, we're good salespeople, all of us. So I found that the mistakes I would make in recruiting over the years is I would sit down with the person and I would do too much talking. I was giving them my pitch. I was so excited to tell them why it would be wonderful to join me and, and that they should come on board. And I didn't even stop to think, do I really want them? So then I knew I have to slow down, calm down, write great questions that I want to ask that person. And if it's a seasoned agent, we really want to do a deep dive into what inspires them, what's their big picture goal. I like to have everyone take the DISC assessment. And that tells me a lot about them and their strengths, which by the way, you can go to forwardcoaching.com, our website, and you'll always see there the link for the DISC assessment, and you use it as much as you want. And I would suggest before you have a deep dive recruiting meeting that you send that link over. And here's my script. Here's what I would say. I would say, you know, when we get together, I really want it to be a conversation all about you and your dreams. And I want to understand you and how I could help you potentially leverage your talent I have this really cool thing, it takes 10 minutes, it's easy, it's a DISC assessment, it is not a test, it is an assessment so I can understand you better. So if I send you the link, would you take it? It'll immediately send you back a 25 page report all about you. Please print it and read it and forward a copy via email over to me. And then when you and I get together, we'll discuss it. So I, I like to really do that, that deep dive with them. And once they're on board, that's the honeymoon phase. That's why I'm saying, do you have some leverage, staff or support to get them in, get them settled in and make sure that they don't have buyer's remorse that they joined you, right? So what is your value proposition and how will you explain it? Often agents will say to me, well, but I don't buy Zillow leads. Okay, what else do you do? Because that's not what it's all about. Sure, it's great if you can supply each team member, you know, 20 to 30 leads a month, and maybe it's a combination of online leads, maybe it's you know, pay-per-click, whatever you do. Is it great to be able to supply them some leads? Absolutely. I remember, though, when I joined my broker as a new agent, he didn't buy me any leads, but he coached me. He mentored me. He held me accountable. He provided open house opportunities for me to go hold, taught me how to do them right, so that I could pick up buyers and sellers and get my own listings and grow my business. When he'd go on listing appointments or he was doing negotiations on the phone, he would grab me and say, shadow me, you know, be quiet, but listen and learn. I, I mean, that's worth its weight in gold. And you're amazingly talented people. You, if you choose to, you have a lot to share, you have a lot to give. So it's not always just about buying leads. So then let's talk about splits. And then of course, I am gonna go back to those questions in the chat box. Splits that allow for you to have profit, 50-50 is best. Now, 
if you're going to scrub a lead, provide a lead, scrub the lead, set the appointment for them, then it may be 35 or 40% that goes to them. The rest goes to you, the house, right? Because you invested to get that lead, you worked that lead or had an ISA work that lead, and you set that up on a silver platter and handed it over to them. Now, not the, the really big teams, but I've seen some of the smaller teams make an allowance that if it is a, a past client or sphere, that they could have a 60% to the agent, but they also require that agent to bring in a list of those people in advance, maximum of 100 that would be excluded and on that higher split, right? So think it through. And many of you are involved with um, organizations, like I know we have many of the operators here that are part of Place Inc. And Place has its own models and, and for a very good reason. Um, maybe, you know, you're looking at this saying, well, this is family, so I love them. I'm willing to pay them more. That's up to you. It's just, remember, we got to make a profit. Okay. So then systems you need to run it. A CRM that can support the team. My belief is everybody on your team must function inside of that same CRM. Otherwise, it's chaos, right? And then if you have a, a CRM, like many of you here, because I recognize names, your Brivity uh, customers, and Brivity is the CRM, of course, that Ben owns. Brivity has a lot of technology built in to support your team as it grows, and it has dashboards and tracking. So if you're going to build a team or going to build your team bigger, just make sure whatever CRM you have or invest in can actually support that team, that they are taught and trained as part of their onboarding process to use that CRM, and they are held accountable to log their calls, to log their leads, and track their activities. So what other system do we need? We need leads. So are we going to teach them how to hunt? I hope so. You know, if you're providing leads for them, that's great, but we still need to teach them how to hunt. We need to expect that they're going to do open houses. We need to look at their personality style and say, would they be a good networker? Would they be, you know, they're high D, they're strong. I think I could send them out on expireds and for sale by owners. You know, some of the teams have a rule that if it's a brand new agent, they either need to be that personality and that commitment to aggressive prospecting or they need to bring a really big sphere to the table. But if you hire a new agent that is new in town, doesn't know anyone, is a little bit on the timid and shy side, is it likely they're going to make it? No, probably not, right? So we need to say, where, where are leads coming from or going to come from? We've got to have listings out there because when we have listings, we have name recognition and gives us some power in the market. And we have open houses and open houses are worth their weight in gold. And then once we get those leads through our CRM, do we have an agreed upon system in the team of how we follow up on those leads? Now, if you are dishing out leads to team agents, it's really important that you track their speed to lead, the number of attempts they make, and their conversion ratio. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to try to remember this stat. It was something like if you get to the lead within five minutes versus 15, your chances of reaching that person almost doubles. Also that the average lead takes six to 12 attempts to convert. The average salesperson doesn't even call half of their leads and the other half they call maybe two or three times. So they're not making it to that six, seven, eight, ninth, 10th, 11th, 12th attempt. So you're gonna wanna manage that and watch that carefully. 
or have someone, director of operations or director of sales, who watches that for you, reports back to you, and holds them accountable. A strong buyer consultation. You know, each of you are, are good at what you do for a reason. You have your secret recipe of what you bring to the table, how you spin and sell that to the buyer or seller, you know, how you interact and follow up, the, the care and service that you provide. So we want them to follow in your footsteps, in your likeness. That's why we need to have that strong buyer consult. We need to give them time and training to master it, test them on it, and then send them back to work on it again until they're flawless. You know, at the end of this month of uh, February, yeah, we're in February today, right? At the end of this month, Fred said and I are going to do another webinar around the buyer consultation topic. Watch for that invite. He's really good. And he teaches his team to do that quite flawlessly. Given the commission issues going on in the world right now, we don't know what's going to happen with that, but I think it's a good time and a good excuse to say, I need a flawless consultation process and I need to teach my team members to get a buyer broker agreement signed to ask for that exclusive commitment and to address the possibility that the buyer might have to cover some of the compensation. Okay. So if you decide that you want to join that, just watch. We'll be sending you the invite and Fred will talk more about that. Okay. Now, another system that you would want to have is what is your recommended and, and upheld, because we're going to hold them accountable, best practices for working your sphere, your past clients, you know, what auto plans, are there mailings that should be going out? Do you expect your team agents to cycle through their list? at least every 90 days. Maybe as a team, you're doing a pie event or family photo in the park. Do you expect your agents to participate? And how do you expect them to announce that? So always remember, the more your team agents have a path to follow, the less they have to do to figure it out for themselves, the better they will do but also the more value then you're bringing to the table. Then, of course, we're going to have to have our best practices for hiring. You know, does someone make calls for you, an appointment set? Are you setting your own recruiting meetings? Is someone pre-screening them or are you the one doing that? So what is your path for recruiting? What about your salary positions? So who do you need on deck? Can you afford that? How are you going to find them? And how are you going to train them? Now, a couple of times a year, we run an administrative training course. It's not coming up, I think, until about May. But just keep your eyes out for that because um, that's a really great course to help you get them trained. And we really want to create an, a, a path for them. And when I say clear expectations, I remember my broker, he was pretty hard on me, but you know, I was 18 and dumb, you know, dumb kid. So I came in the first day, some newly licensed, he signs me up to work in his company. First day I come to the office at 1130 in the morning. And he said, what are you doing? It's 1130. I said, well, I know, but you know, I'm an independent contractor now. I can come in whenever I want. He said, yeah, no, that won't work for me. Here's the thing. You're young. You don't know anything. You have no sphere or contacts. You have no money. So if you're going to work here, I'm going to be clear with you. You're going to do exactly what I say. And if you do what I say to the letter, I guarantee you, I can make you a success. Are you in? And I said, yes, I am. I want to be a success. He said, good. Then here's what we're going to start with. 
You start dressing like you're 30 years old instead of 18. You come in the office at eight o'clock. You're gonna spend three hours on the phone making calls. I will provide lists of who you should dial. I will provide you with a script. Then you're gonna do whatever you have to do to get ready for if there's an appointment or something that has to happen, eat a quick lunch, do your lead follow-up. Then you're gonna go out and you're gonna knock doors for two hours where I tell you to knock. Then you're gonna come back at four o'clock. You're either gonna do more dials or more lead follow-up. If you don't have appointments, your business day ends at 6 p.m. If you have appointments, you may be out till nine o'clock, who knows? And then every Saturday and Sunday, I expect you to be on an open house. And I expect you to knock 100 doors before each open house, inviting the neighbors. It was a big job. But you know what? I didn't know any better because I didn't know what I was supposed to do. And I think that's a mistake we make with our team people that we hire. We just kind of like, okay, here's a desk. And I'll give you some training. Let me know when you have a question. Hour by hour, minute by minute, he told me exactly what I needed to be doing. And he held me accountable to that schedule. And I will say that the reason I became as successful as I did was because of that. Because my first year, I did 36 units. But then I kept following that same plan prospecting basically five plus hours a day. And the next year I did 50 and then 75 and then 100, 110, 156. And then that's when the wheels fell off the bus because I couldn't do more. I was already working too much because teams did not yet exist. So had they existed, had someone been able to tell me what we're talking about today, sky's the limit, right? So it's a lot to, to create that path for them. And that's why your system to onboard is important. What do you expect them to do in the first two weeks? Many of the teams expect them to bring at least a list of 200 sphere. They expect them to come to all scheduled meetings and trainings. They expect them to come in and participate in dial days, prospecting sessions. And at the end of two weeks, when really they should be showing up for you in a big way and they're not showing up, you may just want to let them go. Now, if you think there's hope of potential, then you get a hold of them and you say, if you're going to join me, if you're going to stay on board with me, then you're going to have to do what I tell you to do. We're going to start over. You've got two weeks to restart. We'll do a do-over impress me, and then I'll move on to train you more, right? And for those of you who do want to train and coach your agents, we do have a coach academy I run. It's two hours a month. It's a group program. If you have an interest in that, just reach out, you know, reach out to my team here and we'll let you know how to find out about that. So profit management, I would suggest that you have a good CPA. And as your business grows and gets a little bit more complicated, probably even a bookkeeper. And the nice thing about a bookkeeper, often your CPA can recommend someone who just charges you by the hour and it's just a few hours a month, you know, just to reconcile receipts and statements, make sure everything is coded properly. Because the beauty of that if it's done as you go, when tax time becomes, it's not such a mess. Plus they can point out discrepancies or overspending on a particular category. So we wanna go line by line through that PL every month. Maybe you canceled a subscription, but they never stopped charging you. And, and I'm also very cautious about giving staff carte blanche to order office supplies from Staples. I, I don't, this is a long time ago. My staff here now is flawless and wonderful. But I remember I was allowing that and I came in and the admin had all these fancy colored pins and 
all this stuff all over her desk that was completely not necessary. And I, I started looking around at the things she was ordering. And I realized we were spending about four times more at Staples than we should be. So we got to manage that money. So I get it, guys, right now. It's a lot. You feel like this boy, fire hose, you know, it's such a big topic that as we were putting it together, I felt like, wow, we need to have like a week together. <laughs> so just hit the highlights to get you started thinking. We will send you automatically a copy of this webinar. We're going to send you automatically. Just give us a day or two along with the, the recording, that team building questionnaire. Um, I'm going to make sure you all have my e email. I'm putting that in the chat right now, forwardcoaching.com. See if I did it right. Yep. So as you're working through your team questionnaire, if you want to ask me something, please feel free to reach out. And, you know, I really, I, I get it. Why this is an exciting topic, because it'd be so great to be able to have a team where you could go on vacation sit on the beach, relax without the endless phone calls, also knowing that back home, the team is creating profit for you. So it's a lot and building it is complicated. However, we do have coaches who are absolute experts at it. So if you feel that you need some help with this or just in general, that this may be the year that you need coaching, to take your career to the next level, you can scan that QR code. I have two very gracious gentlemen, Ron and Gary, that work with me. They are customer service. They are not salespeople. They will call you. They will help you get scheduled with me. We will speak and we'll go from there. And no contract, no pressure. So if it's, if it's about time and you want to explore what it's like to work with us, very easy to do that. Okay, so let me go back and just take a look at the questions here. Um, what's a minimum offer proposition value prop someone should provide for the team? I feel that it is that coaching and mentoring, whether you do it yourself or someone else on your team is capable of doing it for you. I love to be able to give them open house opportunities. Maybe in the past you purchased Zillow leads, and you've got some big pond of leads that you can share in that with them and give them to call. The biggest thing of all, though, remember, if they're joining you, they're joining you because they want to be you. They want to learn from you. And that's why that firsthand experience of being able to shadow you is really incredible. Um, so let me just scan down. Um, yep. Uh, I read into this problem hiring photo assistants. Too many nice, pleasant conversations. Found out they weren't under pressure. So I created a more realistic pressure uh, cooker interview. And you're right. Sometimes we are afraid to ask the tough questions, Philip. Also, though, what I like to do is I try to ask questions in that interview that will in enlist a, a true answer, okay? And let me give you an example. So I could say to someone, tell me how many hours are you willing to work? And they might lie to me. But if I said to them, you know, Philip, obviously you're an independent contractor, very entrepreneurial business with some measure of flexibility, if we're going to work together, if we end up choosing to do that, I need to understand so that I can help you create that blueprint that's right for you. Tell me really truthfully, what is the ideal schedule you want to work? How many hours? What days of the week? I really need to know that so I can figure out what would be your success blueprint. And if Philip starts saying, well, you know, I just I have so many hobbies, I'm doing this, and I'm doing that. And 
I can't really predict, but maybe about 20 hours a week. But, you know, I don't like to work evenings and I don't like to work weekends. See, now I got an honest answer, right? So I really like to dig in and try to get them to answer those hard questions. Um, uh, Philip also added, I've decided I won't hire a team member who won't prospect, door knock, or cold call. And, you know, if they're brand new and they don't have a sphere and they're not willing to do that, what else would they do? Right. And that was my situation. As I said, I could I've gone out and created a networking group or networked in some fashion. Sure, I could do that. Would that have been enough? No. And that's why many of our team leaders now say my number one thing I look for is grit. Are they gritty? Are they determined? When I was doing a ton of interviewing to hire new brand spanking new agents, I'll share with you really quickly before I run out of time, a few of the questions I would ask them. I would ask them, tell me, what made you decide to get into real estate? Now, I was hoping I would hear, I want to make money. Sometimes, though, they would say, because I love people, and, and they thought that was a good answer to give me, or sometimes they just really did love people and they don't care about making money, but I, I want to know where their head's at. Then I would ask them, so have you ever sold anything in your life? Girl Scout cookies, paper route. Mm, you know, no, I've never sold anything. Or if they said yes, what was that experience like? How did it go? Was your family in any type of sales? What did your family think of salespeople? What do you think of salespeople in general? See, I want to get in their head because they may have some baggage there. And I'll give you an example. There was one person that I interviewed and we had made a decision to hire everyone and run a test to see were we on the right path in our thoughts about who makes it, who doesn't, and screening? It's kind of an experiment, if you will. Very attractive, 34-year-old, college-educated woman. Super smart. Very nice. She said, I love looking at beautiful houses and I love people. Um, well, when I was a cheerleader, we were supposed to sell wrapping paper to fundraise but I couldn't do it. I just, I could not ask people to buy it. So I just made my mom buy it all. Well, what do your parents do for a living? Well, my dad's a surgeon, my mom's a professor. Well, what do they think of salespeople? Oh, they don't like them. No, no, they don't like them. In fact, my dad was gonna cut me out of the will almost when I got my license and my mom cried. So they weren't very happy that I'm doing this. Hmm, interesting. How do you feel about salespeople in general? Oh, I think they're pushy and I'll never be pushy. So let me ask you guys, type in the chat box. How long do you think she lasted? I'm curious to see if anyone comes up with it. John says two weeks, Philip said three months. You're right, Philip, three months. 90 painful days. And I wanted to be wrong. I really did. I did everything I could to provide the structure and the schedule and inspire her. And it was almost like she felt being a salesperson was barely above being a streetwalker. I could not get that baggage out of her, right? So just lots of questions to Philip's point. Ask the tough questions dig in. If they are in the middle of extreme life drama, don't hire them till the drama is over because they will not make it. If they are financially broke and upside down and so stressed out about it, personally, I won't hire them because you would think, well, they're going to do really good because they're going to step up to get that money to pay, pay their house payment. But it's like the rabbit in the road syndrome. They just can't get out of that spot. So careful. Now, even if you're careful, here's what you should expect. 50% retention. So when you think about this year ahead, think, okay, if I want to net 
four agents added to my team, then I need to hire eight. And if I'm going to hire eight, then how many agents do I need to meet with to get eight? And I'm going to make up a number. Let's say I need to meet with 24 to get eight. Well, then how many calls am I going to have to do to set 24 appointments? So you back reverse engineer. How many do I want to net to be safe if I hire double that? And if we're lucky, they'll all be good, but never usually works that way. I'll hire double that. Then how many do I need to meet with? Then how many do I need to schedule appointments? Because I'll have some no-shows. Then how many do I need to actually call? And the other thing that um, I would think about too is if you're already a, a team, a successful team, front load if you can, first and second quarter, as many of those hires as fast as possible, because we want to give them time to get production on the books for you, right? So that you can make that goal. Okay. So let's see, John, is, is that to determine? Yeah. Ask great questions. Um, look at their life situation. I like to have them do the DISC assessment. Um, not because I would necessarily hire or not off the disc. I just know, for example, that if they're a very high DI, super high I, they'll be challenged sticking to a schedule. I'll have to keep an eye on them and they might talk too much. <laughs> if they're super low D and really high S and C, I know they might be challenged asking for the order closing and I'll have to keep an eye on that. So I think of it, all of that is like a puzzle. And I want to put all those pieces together and ask, are we going to succeed together? Right. So and and so, you know, Philip, to your point about one person cry afterwards, um, I would say. I don't know that scenario. Sometimes they might cry because they self-realize it's not for them. Or they self-realize it's harder. Or possibly, fill up your approach of how you ask the questions. <laughs> I don't know. Coming from curiosity, um, softening it a little bit. Because if they feel under attack, they won't answer you honestly, necessarily. But once they're on board, yes, you pump up the pressure. Tell them what they need to do. Because I think we owe it to them. Sure, we want to make a profit. But being a leader also is a responsibility. And you bring those people into your world and you make commitments that you're going to help them grow and achieve their goal. We can lead the horse to water. We can't make them drink. We can't want it more than they do. But if they're on board with you, then I feel we have to be relentless in showing them the way, right? Or ask them to leave. Um, ben has a third option. He calls it kicking them to the basement. They're doing a little production. They're not a bother. They're not negative, but they're not willing to do what you say. And you just let them do their thing and you move on and spend your energy with your top 20%. Okay, guys. All right. So awesome that you joined me. Thank you so much. Reach out if you need our help. Just give us one to two days. You will get that recording and you will get that team building questionnaire. All right, guys, have a great day. Bye-bye. <music>